Hey, happy Saturday, everybody. Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning eloped on this day in 1846, so we thought it would be a good time to pull that episode out of the archive. Couple of notes. If we were recording this episode today, we'd probably adjust a little bit of the language, both around Elizabeth's chronic illness and disability, and the theory that her father may have been descended from a plantation owner in Jamaica and an enslaved woman. This episode originally came out on February 15th, 2012, and was at the time a Valentine's-themed episode. It is from prior hosts Sarah and Dublina, who, as you'll hear, got a lot more listener requests for massacres than for love stories. As we do. Yep, continues to be true for us. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Dublina Chakraborty. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And even though technically this episode will come out the day after Valentine's Day, we wanted to celebrate the season of love somehow, especially since last year's Valentine's Day Massacre podcast had a couple of (laughs) listeners thinking we were anti-love. We got some critical emails about that one. Yeah, we did. People judged us, but that's okay. And I mean, recently we've done serial killers and boxers and Wild West, and so we thought maybe let's go in a different direction. Yeah, get people ready for a marathon Valentine weekend, maybe. Sure. So initially... I went through some listener requests to try to see if I could find some lovey-dovey ideas, and I had zero luck. I mean, I think our listeners are starting to think about along the same lines as us. There were a lot of (laughs) massacres. I mean, love is just as nice as massacres, people. Sometimes nicer. Sometimes nicer. So we picked a topic on our own, and we settled on talking about one of the most famous romances of the 19th century, if not of all time. It's the romance of Victorian poets Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning. And at first blush, poets in love might not seem like that much of a stretch. I mean, after all, the stereotype is that these guys are sitting around pouring out their feelings all day long on paper anyway, right? Being in love is their job, right? Sure. But Robert and Elizabeth had truly a unique relationship, complete with forbidden love, a tyrannical father, a mysterious, incurable illness, clandestine meetings, and lots and lots of love letters. So not to give too much of the story away already, but hopefully that'll be a good teaser for you guys. Well, and the story of their courtship truly seems like something worthy of a poem or work of fiction, and their relationship did actually influence their work in various ways that we can still appreciate today. And of course, like many of the stories that we tell, there are a few twists here that modern research has given us, one of which, conveniently enough, since it is February, in addition to being Valentine's Day, ties into Black History Month. How about that? But before we can dive into the story of the romance between these two people, we've got to tell you a little bit about what their lives were like before they met. Because for both Robert and Elizabeth, you can look at their biographies in distinct phases, pre-courtship and then post. Elizabeth was born Elizabeth Barrett on March 6, 1806, in County Durham, England. She was the eldest of 11 children of Edward Moulton Barrett and Mary Graham Clark. Her family was fairly well-to-do, and Elizabeth grew up mainly at her parents' 500-acre estate in Herefordshire, known somewhat poetically as Hope End. She was an active and precocious kid and maybe even something of a tomboy, which I found kind of surprising considering what we'll find out about her in her later life. But according to an article by Michael Timko in World and I, she was, quote, given to fisticuffs and, quote, throwing things about the house. She sounds like a bit of a terror, doesn't she? But she was also really into her studies. She was a very good student. She learned Greek and Latin at an early age. But because she was a girl, she didn't get to go off and continue her studies at a private school like her brothers did. And the fact that she couldn't do that really disappointed her. Unlike other privileged girls of this time, Elizabeth did get to go further in her education in other ways, though, even though she didn't get to go to school. Her parents encouraged her to read. Her father gave her full access to his library. She took full advantage of that, reading both the classics and uh, contemporary literature of the day. She especially liked romantic fiction and became a big fan of George Sand eventually. 
Even though Elizabeth's father encouraged her education at home this way, though, he was still very controlling, ran a very strict household. We'll talk about his deal a lot more lately. So knowing that, it's almost surprising how much he encouraged his eldest daughter's writing. He arranged to have one of her epic poems on the Battle of Marathon privately published when she was only 14 years old. He was a a supportive parent in that respect. He definitely was. And by all accounts, Elizabeth really loved him as well and wanted to please him. This eagerness to please may actually explain the formality and the seriousness of her early work. And when she was 15, though, things took a turn for the worse, and she fell mysteriously ill for the first time. She started having chest pain, so something seemed to be affecting her lungs, and she also complained of a, quote, swollen spine. And some thought this was a nervous breakdown or some sort of psychosomatic condition triggered by her favorite brother, Edward, leaving home. Modern researchers of course, has have offered other theories, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But regardless of what the exact problem was, it would affect Elizabeth for the rest of her life. She was always really physically weak and would occasionally have these sort of attacks where her health would worsen for a little while. Her doctor prescribed opium in the form of laudanum for her, and she became addicted to that, too. So that sort of added to the Bad problem. track to be on. And mm-hmm. her health really got worse in the 1830s. She went to Turkey to recover. And she even talked her father into having Edward, that favorite brother, come and stay with her for a little while. But tragedy struck again. Her brother drowned while he was visiting her. She ended up blaming herself since, you know, she had pressured her father into sending him in the first place. And after that, her health just really continued to decline. She had more bouts of feeling extremely ill. And by the 1840s, she was pretty much an invalid. She spent most of her time in a dark room taking laudanum and really didn't see people very much at all. She still wrote, though. She published several books of poetry, including Seraphim and Other Poems in 1838 and just Poems in 1844, which were both quite successful. She had fans all over the place, even across the pond in America. A fan, just as an example of how famous she was, once sent her a letter addressed simply, Elizabeth Barrett, poetess, London. And it made it to her. She received it. it. I mean, I just wonder what would happen if someone sent, you know, Sarah and Dublina podcasters, Atlanta. Maybe like Santa Claus is the only (laughs) one who can get away with an address like that. Uh, But Robert Browning started in a very different place from Elizabeth, but in some ways they weren't really all that different. He was born May 7th, 1812, in a suburb of London into a middle-class family. His father was a clerk at the Bank of England. And Robert, like Elizabeth, also didn't receive a lot of formal education, though according to Encyclopedia Britannica, his father did teach him Greek and Latin. And also like Elizabeth, he was largely self-taught and spent a lot of time reading works from his father's library and visiting art museums. He did get a little bit of formal education in. In 1828, he went to the University of London, but left after only half a semester. Like Elizabeth, too, he had this strong affinity for romantic literature in particular, which really makes sense if you've read either of their writing. Particularly, he liked the works of Percy Bysshe Shelley, who we've talked about on the podcast before, so you guys know all about him. Browning did have a few trips, not exactly a grand tour, but a few jaunts to St. Petersburg and Italy as a younger man. But besides that, he basically lived with his parents until 1846, and this is when he wrote his early long poems and most of his plays. There was one major difference, though, between Robert and Elizabeth. Unlike Elizabeth, Robert's early work wasn't very well received. One of his poems, Sordello, was considered to be incomprehensible, and his plays were pretty unpopular, too. So they seemed to be on a different career trajectory. In the 1840s, Elizabeth was actually way more famous than he was, and he really admired her work. So you can imagine his surprise and pleasure when in her poem called Lady Geraldine's Courtship, which came out in that 1844 collection we mentioned, she referred favorably to his poetry. And he was so flattered, he wrote his first letter to her on January 10th, 1845, and he started it by saying, quote, I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett. And in the same letter later wrote, I do, as I say, love these books with all my heart, 
and I love you too. Oh, he took it up a notch there. He so did. Elizabeth wrote back to him the very next day saying, I thank you, dear Mr. Browning, from the bottom of my heart. And quote, I have learned to know your voice, not merely from the poetry, but from the kindness in it. So it kind of sounds like she's reciprocating there a little bit. Oh, yeah. And thus began their correspondence. And they wrote to each other pretty regularly after that. At first, though, Elizabeth didn't think anything romantic would really come of this. She felt this way for a lot of reasons. I mean, for one thing, she didn't really think that she'd ever fall in love. She was about 38, 39 years old at this point and considered a spinster at this time, you know, being that age and unmarried. And she was also, as we mentioned, an invalid who barely saw the light of day, much less people outside of her family. So she just really didn't see herself as a catch. Then there was her dad. And we mentioned he was rather controlling, but probably the most famous of his edicts was forbidding any of his children, including both daughters and sons, from ever marrying. So, of course, you kind of wonder, why would anybody want to make such a rule? I mean, after all, if your kids don't get married, you're not going to have any legitimate grandchildren, no legal heirs. Pretty unusual way of thinking, especially around this time. So nobody knows for sure what motivated Elizabeth's father to make this rule. There are several theories, though, and we're going to run through a couple of those. Some people think it was just this whole Victorian patriarchal thing. He wanted to keep his kids at home and under his control for the entirety of their lives. Others think it was because he was uncomfortable with the idea of his children's sexuality. But, I mean, although... This makes sense even for us today with father-daughter relationships. I mean, you can see a father not really being comfortable with that idea about his little girl. But it's a little stranger to think that he'd feel that way about his sons, too. There's a third theory, though, one that's a little outside of the norm that's emerged in recent years, and that's that Elizabeth's father wanted to put an end to their family line, not because they had some horrible thing that had happened in their past, but because he believed they had, quote, mixed blood. So in other words, he thought that they were part black. You have to wonder, okay, how would this have been possible? How would he suspect that there were uh, Africans in his family? Well, they were the descendants of wealthy Jamaican plantation owners. So it was not uncommon for white plantation owners to have black mistresses. And Julia Marcus wrote a book called Dared and Done, The Marriage of Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning. And she really explored this theory in depth that that um, Barrett's father was just trying to to end the line, despite his 11 children he had already sired, to, um, to eliminate their mixed ancestry. And interestingly enough, we should also say that Robert Browning was also a descendant of Jamaican plantation owners and is also thought to be of mixed race heritage. I've seen him described as having some, quote, Creole blood in him from his paternal grandmother's side. And that he had some African blood in him is actually a little bit more widely accepted, I think, than the related theories about Elizabeth and her father. I think he might have even discussed similar issues or those issues directly during his lifetime. So whatever Barrett's father's reason, though, for standing in the way of all of his children's marriages, Elizabeth knew this was going to be an issue before the courtship even started. For Robert's part, he was six years younger than Elizabeth and considered a handsome man, quite dashing, but he didn't really seem inclined to fall head over heels in love either until he started corresponding to Elizabeth, his literary crush after all. And after they'd written to each other for a while, Robert started to ask when they could meet. And Elizabeth avoided this for some time, but he was really persistent. And finally, they set a date for him to call on her on May 20th, 1845 at three in the afternoon. And Elizabeth's family at that time was living at 50 Wimple Street in London, and Robert came over and stayed for an hour and a half. But it must have been a really good 90 minutes because a few days later, Robert sent her a letter declaring his love for her. And we don't know exactly what that letter said because she apparently returned it to him and asked him to burn it, which he did. Perhaps she was scared of her father finding it. Mm. It's a possibility. But she wrote to him after that and said, quote, you do not know what pain you give me in speaking so wildly. Forget it once or forever having said it at all. And it probably wasn't just her fear of her father that made her react this way. 
Yeah, after all, Robert had come on pretty strong, pretty quickly, and Elizabeth probably didn't think that his feelings were sincere. After all, this relationship had started with, um, you know, him responding to her kind words in poetry. He apologized, though, writing, quote, I wrote to you in an unwise moment, and they continued corresponding. He probably figured he'd rather have her as a friend, as a correspondent, than not get to talk to her at all. So the letters continued, the visits continued without her father really picking up on what was going on, understanding the full extent of their friendship and the frequency of their contact. Yeah, I think he might have known that these two poets were coming together, probably thinking they were just making shop talk. Yeah, exactly. But he didn't realize that Robert was coming over so frequently and that they were getting so close. Well, and that shop talk for two romantic poets can kind (laughs) of veer off into actual romance. Very true. And as they, sure enough, that's what happened. As they continued to talk and to get to know each other, their friendship blossomed into love and Elizabeth began to reciprocate Robert's feelings. She became more comfortable and began, be, began to trust his feelings and emotions. And as they grew closer, he wanted to go to Elizabeth's father and ask for her hand in marriage. She but, knew what the answer would be to that, though. Yeah, she knew her father very well and she knew he would never consent. So she, unlike Robert, was willing to kind of keep going the way they were, just writing letters and seeing each other now and again Visits and at hanging her house. out yeah. and never really sealing the deal, never really getting married. But finally, things came to a head in 1846 when Elizabeth's doctor recommended she go to Italy for her health. He was basically like, you need to get to a warmer climate, otherwise you won't survive another winter here. But Elizabeth's father wouldn't let her go. It seemed like he was so determined to keep her at home and under his thumb, even if that meant she would die. So when the winter of 1846 rolled around, Elizabeth and Robert finally took action. They decided to get married secretly, and it was really one of the hardest decisions Elizabeth ever made because she knew that she'd probably lose her father if she ran off and got married. And even though he doesn't seem that lovable, even though he might seem uh, quite strange for imposing a rule like this on all of his children, Elizabeth did love her father, and she didn't think he was at fault for his views either. She blamed the patriarchal system for how he was, but still, decision made to get married. She snuck out and set off for Marlebone Church one Saturday that September, where Robert was waiting for her. Her maid, Wilson, went along kind of as a um, an attendant, and she got faint. Elizabeth got faint on the way, and they had to stop briefly at a chemist for some smelling salts, but eventually she did make it, and she and Robert were finally married. After the ceremony, though, they didn't get to walk hand in hand off to a new home together. They had to part ways for a little while, and she had to take off her wedding ring and go home to her father. And then finally, a week later, they left for Italy, as they had planned to do. Elizabeth only took a few items of clothing, a couple of books, her dog, and her maid along with her, probably because her maid would have gotten in trouble if her father had found out the Knew part she, was she played. In on it. Um And she also took all of the letters that Robert had written to her during their courtship. Fortunately for us. Um, So as expected, Elizabeth's father never forgave her for disobeying him. She wrote several letters to him just begging for forgiveness, trying to explain herself, asking if they could meet. And at some point, he sent her a package returning all of the letters she'd sent him, all of which were unopened. And she later wrote to her sister Arabella, quote, I could never tell you what I felt when those letters came back to me, nine or ten of them, all with their unbroken seals, testifying to the sealed up heart which refused to be opened by me. So that aspect of her marriage and her move were really sad for Elizabeth. But Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning ended up in Florence, where they lived for their entire marriage, though they did occasionally take holidays in France and in England. And despite Elizabeth's sadness over losing her father, their marriage has been described as pretty happy. They ended up getting an income and eventually an inheritance from Elizabeth's cousin, which they lived off of. And they both continued to write. Elizabeth, in particular, 
published a collection of her poetry in 1850 called Sonnets from the Portuguese, which included poems written secretly to her husband during her courtship. And these poems are some of her most well-known. How Do I Love Thee, Let Me Count the Ways is among those. Though according to the Dictionary of World Biography, that's the, the fact that they're well-known is less for any intrinsic artistic excellence than for their abiding romantic and psychological portrait of developing love. The kind of thing you'd write on Valentine's cards, right? Exactly. Elizabeth ended up publishing about three more works after that, including Aurora Lee, an epic poem in nine books that's considered by some to be her masterpiece. And after the death of William Wordsworth, she was a serious contender to replace him as England's poet laureate, but Alfred Lord Tennyson was chosen instead, beat her out for that position. So meanwhile, with all of this professional success, the Brownings were starting their life together, too, their married life together. Elizabeth had two miscarriages before the couple had a son who they named Robert in 1849. They called him Penn, however, to avoid any confusion (laughs) in the family. Ultimately, the couple were married for 15 years when Elizabeth finally succumbed to illness and died June 29, 1861, in Robert's arms. He later wrote to his sister, quote, She is with God who takes from me the life of my life. And to this day, people still speculate what Elizabeth's illness actually was. Some think it was severe asthma or tuberculosis, maybe pertussis, maybe even anorexia nervosa or paralytic scoliosis. One of the latest theories, though, from a researcher at Penn State University named Anne Buchanan and her daughter, suggests that it might be a condition called hypokalemic periodic paralysis, or HKPP, which is a muscle disorder. So that's still kind of up in the air, the question of what really happened to her. One of my favorite subgenres, I think, of of doing these history podcasts are the medical mystery. Yeah, reevaluating old illnesses. I mean, they come up with these theories a lot of times just from reading, you know, reading letters letters and seeing what her symptoms were. Occasional doctor advice, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, It's pretty amazing what they can sometimes come up with. So after Elizabeth's death, though, Robert Browning moved back to England with his son. And the first thing he did was publish a collection of his wife's last work entitled Last Poems. I mean, if that's not a love letter to your departed wife, I don't know what is. Then he continued on with his own work, got back to to his career. During his marriage, he had published a few things, including the collection entitled Men and Women in 1855. But this wasn't as popular as his later work. With his 1864 book of poems called Dramatis Personae, he finally started to gain popularity and eventually became a bigger name, arguably, than his wife. By most accounts, his love for Elizabeth never died. He promised her on her deathbed that he would never remarry, and he never did. He did, however, socialize quite a bit, and he had friendships with many females. I see that written a lot. I'm not (laughs) sure to what extent those friendships went, but there's even evidence that he proposed to women on a couple of occasions. So he might have remarried if he could have. But, I mean— It's easy to see kind of why he got shot down if you look at some of the accounts of these proposals. According to Timko's article, when proposing to one Lady Ashburton, Robert Browning said, quote, my heart is buried in Florence. So not really a great way to win a girl over. We're not that surprised that she said no after that. No, that's really not a great tactic to take. But some people think that some not-so-sweet things happened toward the end of the Browning's relationship. In a 2008 article in The Guardian, writer Elizabeth Lowry, using Browning's poem My Last Duchess as evidence, explored the idea that Robert actually gave Elizabeth an extra dose of morphine at the end, which led her to death. I'm not sure if that was done in some sort of sympathy or to finish her off. Yeah, I mean, it's unclear. But again, this is just a theory. We like to throw those out there. Don't know if it even happened. Yeah, we're not sure if that is even the case. But we like to present our listeners with all the information we have at our fingertips so that you can kind of mull over those things and decide what you think. We should say, too, most literature professors might not be 
too big fans of uh, using My Last Duchess as biographical evidence. Very true. <laughs> but, I mean, most people seem to believe their love to have been irreproachable. And so that we can end on a nicer note for this Valentine's Day episode, we're going to read a little bit from Robert's poem, One Word More, which he dedicated to Elizabeth. It goes, God be thanked. The meanest of his creatures boasts two soul sides, one to face the world with, one to show a woman he loves her. This I say of me, but think of you, love. This to you, yourself, my moon of poets. Ah, but that's the world side. There's the wonder. Thus they see you, praise you, think they know you. There, in turn, I stand with them and praise you, out of myself. I dare to phrase it. But the best is when I glide from them, cross a step or two of dubious twilight, come out on the other side, the novel silent silver lights and darks undreamed of, where I hush and bless myself with silence. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 